I feel like I'm actually thinking about my paper and reworking it as we go. I don't have the desire to like describe little things. It's a little more complicated. Oh, right. Very happy to introduce Philippe Schwab, who's assistant professor of philosophy at Freiburg University in Germany, a specialist of German idealism. Philippe is the author of a monograph on Kierkegaard, who does make an appearance uh, in Geschlecht 3, albeit brief. Philippe has edited the work of Schelling, is co-editor of collective volumes on Schelling, Schopenhauer, and Kierkegaard. He's published numerous essays on Heidegger, on Hegel, Schelling, Kierkegaard, and others. Perhaps most relevantly for our gathering today, Philip has also written on Derrida as a reader of Heidegger and Nietzsche, which brings us uh, straight away to the title of his talk today, Nietzsche's Presence in Derrida's Reading of Heidegger in Geschlecht 3. Please welcome Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Faith, for the... Uh, introduction and most of all for uh, setting up this wonderful event. Uh, it's an honor to to be part of this. So I have to uh, begin by making a slight change to my title. Namely, I have to insert a question mark, uh, one at least, and probably several, because uh, the topic that I will try to address today, in fact, came to me as a question. And in working out the paper, I must confess I realized uh, that the topic to a certain extent, still remained a question. So what I will be basically doing today is merely to outline or to unfold a question. And in this case, for obvious reasons, uh, I'm especially looking forward to the discussion then. So put as a question, the title of my talk should read something like the following. Is Nietzsche present in or absent from Derrida's readings of Heidegger in the Geschlecht texts and in Geschlecht three especially? And to add a second question that follows from the first, uh, in what way then is Nietzsche present in or absent from these texts? But even put, uh, but even if put as a question, or maybe even more so, this might very well seem to be an odd or arbitrary thing to ask. And what could easily feel inclined to ask back, why should Nietzsche be <laughs> present here? And what difference does it make? <laughs> you could ask, well, is Freud present or is Hegel present? So it seems to be arbitrary. Uh, so in the following, I will first have to, uh, first of all, have to clarify why I think this is not an arbitrary question at all, why I think it even is, in a certain sense, a necessary question to ask, and why I think it makes quite a difference. I will thereby also attempt to show that this question, uh, re the question regarding Nietzsche's presence and or absence, may serve to shed some light on further questions more obviously connected to the Geschlecht texts. Namely, on the one hand, I think the question, where is Nietzsche, could serve to illuminate the specific manner or style or strategy of Derrida's readings of Heidegger in the Geschlecht text. So the question, where is Nietzsche here, I think relates to the question, how does Derrida read Heidegger here? So it relates to the question Derrida asks with respect to Heidegger, but that we can also ask with respect to Derrida himself. The question that interests him the most, perhaps, as he says, he says that several times, but he says, that's what interests me the most, perhaps. And he says, what is Heidegger doing when reading Tarka? And so we can ask, what is Derrida doing when uh, reading Heidegger? A question that we've already addressed in uh, several talks. So the one side, uh, or one aspect I, I think is connected to the, to the Nietzsche question is, uh, how does Derrida actually read Heidegger? And on the other hand, I believe this question could also contribute to a further question, which one might call in a more classical hermeneutic setting, the question of the continuity of Derrida's readings of Heidegger. So that question would be, how does uh, Derrida's reading of Heidegger in the Geschlecht texts, and in Geschlecht we especially, relate to his earlier texts on Heidegger? These two issues, which I take to be connected to the Nietzsche question, are big questions in themselves, of course, and complicated ones and I won't pretend to be able to say much about them here and today. But what I will try to do is to outline a perspective according to which these aspects could relate to one another productively. To repeat three aspects, first, Nietzsche's presence or absence in the Geschlecht texts. Second, Derrida's strategy of reading Heidegger in these texts. And then third, the question of a continuity, and I always put that in quotation marks, of these readings with earlier readings of, or at least utterances on Heidegger. 
So in the first part of my talk, I will try to unfold what is in the background of asking the Nietzsche question, that is to elaborate why I take this to be a necessary question in a certain sense. And then in the second part, in turning to the Geschlecht text, and to Geschlecht 3 especially, I will attempt to at least point to what possible answers to this question could look like. That is to say, overall, I will in my talk address the conference topic from an oblique angle, so to speak, moving through some backgrounds of Geschlecht 3. And nonetheless, I hope this will contribute to the discussion of our topic. So first part, the Nietzsche Heidegger Derrida constellation. Let me begin this part by quoting one longer passage which should shed some light on my guiding question and why I think it is not an arbitrary one to ask. This passage will be, in a way, the hinge or the axis around which the following considerations will re revolve. We find it in the first interview in Positions, uh, so the interview being from 1967. Here, Derrida says or writes the following. Nothing of what I have attempted to do would have been possible without the opening of Heidegger's questions. And first, without the attention to what Heidegger calls the difference between being and beings, the ontico-ontological difference. But despite this depth to Heidegger's thought, or rather because of it, I attempt to locate in Heidegger's texts, which, no more than any other, is not homogeneous, continuous, everywhere in accordance with the greatest force, and with all the consequences of its question, uh, so he will attempt in Heidegger's text, the science of a belonging to metaphysics or to what he calls ontotheology. Derrida goes on to say, we must attempt to locate these metaphysical grasps or holds, as pris in French, and to reorganize unceasingly the form and the sites of question. Now, among all these holds, the ultimate determination of an ontico-ontological difference however necessary and decisive this phase may be, still seems to me, in a strange <coughs> way, to be in the grasp of metaphysics. So that's where he locates the metaphysical hold in the first place. And now, entrance Nietzsche. Maybe it is necessary, by means of a gesture that would be more Nietzschean than Heideggerian, by going to the end of this thought of the truth of being, to open oneself to a difference that is no longer determined in the language of the West as difference between being and beings. Such a gesture is doubtlessly not possible today, but one could show how it is in preparation. Then Derrida adds, in Heidegger, first of all. <laughs> so that's my starting point. Obviously, uh, precisely at that point, where Derrida locates a certain complicity of Heidegger, so to speak, of, his, of Heidegger's thought with metaphysics, or where he takes Heidegger to be, in a way, repeating a gesture of metaphysics, precisely this is where Nietzsche comes into play. And the issue addressed in this passage, ontological difference, is quite a decisive point, apparently, and one which will still attract Derrida's attention in the Geschlecht texts, most obviously in Geschlecht 1, which we should keep in mind. So that's why I quote the passage. And by the way, one remark on translation, both the official German and the English translation don't have the word geste or gesture here, where the French has geste. But I think the word, even if it uh, would sound a bit strange in this context in English, so uh, they say along Nietzschean lines, not a Nietzschean gesture, uh, I think this word gesture is necessary and important. For what is at stake here is a way of moving the gesture, not a content, but the gesture, the way of moving the philosophical movement, and more, Derrida says, more Nietzschean than Heideggerian. Before I try to unfold this constellation and this specific Nietzschean movement a bit deeper conceptually, and actually in order to unfold it sufficiently, let me hurry to say that this is by no means an isolated or arbitrary passage in Derrida's work. Rather, a quite strong cluster of important texts in these years and the following will present variations of this constellation. Most of these texts being probably very familiar to all of you, but maybe perhaps not in this light. I will, uh, therefore, in the following, point to some of these texts all too briefly to enrich the picture and then try to bring these threads together again before then moving to the Geschlecht text. So to begin with, uh, the famous and influential essay Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences, <coughs> written in 1966, uh, so before the statement from position, presents the triad Nietzsche, Freud, Heidegger, as those thinkers decentering metaphysics. But Derrida points out that all three of them are determined necessarily by a circular movement 
namely to have to use elements from the very system of metaphysics they're attempting to dislocate. And this, Derrida says, is what allows these destroyers to destroy each other reciprocally. For example, Heidegger, considering Nietzsche with as much lucidity and rigor as bad faith and misconstruction as the last metaphysician, the last Platonist. One could do the same for Heidegger himself, Derrida says. Here the important cause or case, as Derrida will later call it himself, Heidegger reads Nietzsche comes into view. And within the ambiguous situation of the closure of metaphysics, both ways or directions appear to be possible. Deconstructing Nietzsche with Heidegger, which however already here seems to be quite a problematic operation, but also to deconstruct Heidegger along Nietzschean lines. Then, a more detailed account of these two directions is then to be found in the 1967 of Grammatology, in the chapter written B. Here the triad is now Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Hegel in that um, order, surprisingly. Uh, so Hegel is the, the final one. First, Derrida writes that Nietzsche, read in light of his radicalization of the concepts of interpretation, perspective, evaluation, and difference, is far from, I quote, remaining simply with Hegel and as Heidegger wished within metaphysics. Rather, in this first order of reading, so the first direction of reading, Heidegger himself would not weaken, would rather reinstate the instance of the logos and the truth of being as primum signato. So again, as in positions, Heidegger's question for the truth of being marks the decisive point of a certain complicity with metaphysics. But second then, Derrida also outlines the counter draw or counter direction viewed from a different angle with Heidegger, the Nietzschean demolition on its part remains, Derrida says, dogmatic and like all reversals, a cactus of the, that metaphysical edifice which it professes to overthrow. And along these lines, the second uh, direction, uh, it is then Heidegger's questioning, which does not simply restore metaphysical guarantees, but on the contrary, Derrida says, dislodges them to their proper depth and thus contributes to the dislocation of the unity of the sense of being. So whereas in these first two texts I touched upon both movements or gestures, the Heideggerian and the Nietzschean gesture, seem equally possible, and sometimes even the Heideggerian seems to be more promising, this, this will shift in the following texts, and quite the way the passage from positions had indicated. Most of all, this is, in the, this is the case in a passage we can, I think, consider decisive for Derrida's uh, own discourse, own in quotation uh, uh, marks, namely the final part from the 1967 Difference essay, in which Derrida deals with Heidegger, ontological difference again, and the name of the difference. For difference is not simply to be taken as the ontological difference between being and beings, rather, it in a certain sense still precedes and at the same time escapes from this determination. But precisely because therefore it is, I quote, older than being itself, and precedes thus even the question of being, Derrida says that such a difference has no name in our language. And here again we encounter the trait of Heidegger's thought, which is still in a certain complicity with metaphysics, namely, as Derrida puts it here, his quest for the proper word and the unique name of being, a quest, a quest which Derrida also terms the Heideggerian hope, which relates to the topic of Heimat, which I just discussed. And by contrast, with respect to difference, Derrida repeats, there will be no unique name, even if it were the name of being. And we must think this without nostal nostalgia, that is, outside the myth of a purely maternal or paternal language, so here's the, the mother again, a lost native country of thought that we would need to reappropriate with Heidegger. And again, right here, where Derrida, in a way, moves through and beyond the ultimate position of the ontological difference as the quest for a unique name and an original word of being, this is where Nietzsche comes into play. Uh, I quote, on the contrary, we must affirm this, this impossibility of having a unique word. We must affirm this in the sense which Nietzsche, in which Nietzsche puts affirmation into play in a certain laughter and a certain step of the dance. This is the, the, the way he puts it here. So the affirmation of an irreducible non-originality of difference, the affirmation of the impossibility of centering thought around one proper word or one unique name 
That is the Nietzschean gesture here, opening up as Derrida decenters ontological difference. Quite a similar constellation, I will just touch on that very briefly, is to be found in the final parts of The Ends of Man from 1968. So these two texts have uh, uh, similar final parts in a way. Derrida pointedly presents the aforementioned double movement as a double possibility. I quote, must one read Nietzsche with Heidegger as the last of the great metaphysicians, or on the contrary, are we to take the question of the truth of being as the last sleeping shudder of the superior man? Pointing to Zarathustra, the höhere Mensch. Although Derrida makes clear that there can never be a simple alternative between these two forms of deconstruction, as he calls them here, the Nietzschean version comes into view more distinctly, especially when Derrida, one page before this, refers to Nietzsche's quest for a change of style as to that which we today need, perhaps, he says. And Derrida adds, if there is style, Nietzsche reminded us, it must be in the plural. Now this remark on the plurality of styles apparently paves the way for a transition to that text of Derrida, which most prominently <coughs> unfolds an affirmative reading of Nietzsche, thereby disembedding him, as it were, from the Heideggerian interpretation. That's the Spurs text, first presented in 1972, uh, Spurs, the styles of Nietzsche. Here, uh, Derrida weaves, well, weaves together the plurality of styles in Nietzsche with the plurality of images Nietzsche puts forward with respect to the question of the woman, as Derrida uh, calls it here. And in this context, though even if only in passing, Derrida quotes the German word Geschlecht from Nietzsche's Joyful Wisdom, Aphorism 70. And this is not by coincidence, I think. Let me therefore direct attention to a passage which is particularly remarkable with a view to the Geschlecht texts, then. This passage is one of the decisive knot points of the Spurs essay, for here Derrida points to the maximal, maximal heterogeneity of Nietzsche's texts. And he then writes that the question of the woman in Nietzsche, that is, the irreducible plurality of what woman actually means in Nietzsche's text, this plurality suspends the decidable opposition of true and untrue and inaugurates the epochal regime of quotation marks. And thus brings the hermeneutic project, which postulates a true sense of the text to its limit. So apparently Heidegger's project in reading Nietzsche. And it is here in underlining the affirmative movement in Nietzsche, uh, or in which Nietzsche's text has always already escaped Heidegger's interpretation, that Derrida ties together Heidegger with the question of sexual difference, already in, in the 72 text. Derrida, Derrida's point of departure here is a passage from Nietzsche's How the True World Finally Became a Fable from Twilight of the Idols, where Nietzsche writes in step two of the history of the truth that the idea becomes female. Sie wird weiblich, die Idee. And Heidegger, in his thorough interpretation of the, this, this uh, uh, passage in Nietzsche, analyzes every step very closely, but he doesn't say anything about this becoming female of the idea. And Derrida comments that Heidegger here misses the woman in truth's fabulous plotting, and that his reading of Nietzsche doesn't pose the sexual question, or at least subsumes it to the general question of the truth of being. So here we have that motif again. And Derrida asks back, but hasn't it just been cited that the question of sexual difference was not a regional question, subordinate to a general ontology, then to a fundamental ontology, and finally to the question of the truth of being itself? and that it perhaps may no longer even be a question, something that we, we could question and think it too is, is proper. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it is a Nietzschean gesture and a movement performed with Nietzsche which undermines, so to speak, the ontological fundamentality and either this questioning aimed at the unique truth of being. And in this instance already Derrida does so by disentangling the question of sexual difference from the priority of the question of ontological difference. Finally, before closing my short detour through Derrida's text Pre-Geschlecht, let me underline that still in 1980, in his discussion with Gadamer, and I think not by coincidence, Derrida draws heavily on the Nietzsche-Heidegger case in his interpreting signatures, Nietzsche-Heidegger. So by the way, this text has an interesting story uh, too, and is in need of another archival <coughs> discovery, so maybe you will find it, uh, because the interpreting signatures text was never published in French, but only in an uh, in a English and German translation. And apparently the original manuscript has gone lost. So as I had to quote from this text in an essay that was supposed to be French, I had to ask somebody help me retranslate the German and English translation into the French original 
which wasn't there, which was uh, quite an interesting uh, Derrida -de 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 moment to do so. Now, this text is uh, quite straightforward in addressing difficulties with Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche, and one might even call it a critique or a criticism, terms that Derrida -de rejects elsewhere for good reasons, in Spurs, but also in Schlecht. Again, Derrida here shows how Nietzsche's text escapes, so to speak, from Heidegger's interpretation, as expressed in one of the opening lines from the preface to Heidegger's Nietzsche book, stating here, Heidegger, that in Nietzsche, the name of the thinker stands as the title for the subject matter of his thought. The name des Denkers steht für die Sache seines Denkens. And Derrida disembeds Nietzsche from such an interpretation by focusing precisely on the name and pointing to a politics of the name in Nietzsche, that is, the plurality of names, signatures, and ways of speaking in Nietzsche, which don't fit in this, the name of Nietzsche stands for one Sache seines Denkens, one, uh, one, one basic thought, as Heidegger has it. And in this context, uh, Derrida makes a quasi-methodological remark, which uh, in a way nicely brings together the lines of thought <coughs> I've been following for the last couple of minutes. Derrida says here, when reading Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche, it is possibly less a matter of suspecting the content of an interpretation than of a presupposition or an axiomatic structure. This uh, is, uh, to talk about an axiology or an axiomatic structure in Heidegger recurs then in of spirit. So this is what we have to question, the axiomatic structure in of Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche. And this is perhaps the axiomatic, Derrida says, of metaphysics inasmuch as metaphysics itself desires or dreams or imagines its own unity. A strange circle, an axiomatic structure that consequently demands an interpretation, one gathered up around unifying a unique text and ultimately the unique name for being for the experience of being. With the value of the name, this unity and this oneness mutually guard themselves against dangers of dissemination. Here, perhaps, to take the words from Heidegger's preface, lies the Streitfall, or the case, or cause, or the Auseinandersetzung discussion between the Nietzsches and Martin Heidegger, between the Nietzsches and so-called Western metaphysics. Now, this leads me back to my starting point. While, uh, on the one hand, uh, my outlining of a structural cons uh, constellation pre geschlecht text might have appeared a bit too long with respect to the actual topic, uh, on the other hand, I nonetheless had to touch on a bundle of multi-layered and complicated texts rather briefly, admittedly not doing full justice to their subtleties. Nonetheless, I hope a significant structure has come into view which motivates the, question, uh, uh, the questions I posed at the outset of my talk. A structure, of course, that doesn't form a simple continuity, but rather enfolds in a series of differential repetitions and variations. Now, with a view to the rather straightforward passage from positions I started with, and with the following text in mind, this structure might nonetheless be put as follows. In his readings of Heidegger, Derrida attempts to locate those gestures which still show a certain and necessary complicity with metaphysics. And this is most of all repeatedly to be found when Heidegger unfolds the ontico-ontological difference, or ontological difference, in such a way that it aims towards the one and unique question of the truth of being. And this is the recurrence of a metaphysical gesture insofar as it is directed at that which is even more original than the being of beings, the sein des sein, then as metaphysics presented it in Heidegger's vocabulary. Um, it goes, uh, so Heidegger's questioning goes one step further, so to speak, in aiming at an original truth, even more original than the truth of metaphysics. And in trying to further dislocate this gesture, Derrida's readings attempt to open up the Heideggerian text to a ge gesture which he associates with the name of Nietzsche. That is, an affirmation of a difference not anymore subordinate to the quest for an original truth as such. A decentered difference no longer regulated by one master word, so to speak, be it that of a metaphysical first principle or even that of the truth of being. The same thing put differently, the Heideggerian movement is still, uh, to a certain degree, a vertical gesture, so to speak, establishing a hierarchy within a difference, namely that between the original being and derivative beings das ursprüngliche Sein und das abkünftige Seiende, so to speak. The Nietzschean text, by contrast, 
unfolds and folds in a horizontal or circular movement such that even if it may establish vertical hierarchies within its field, it constantly and affirmatively undermines these hierarchies and with them any metaphysical um, stances it might itself involve. Or at least the Nietzschean text has the affirmative potential to constantly undermine its own metaphysical stances, such as the will to power and so forth. Of course, one must quickly add that Derrida never simply opposes Nietzsche to Heidegger, so I simplified that uh, image a little bit, such as to criticize Heidegger. Or he almost never does that. Perhaps one could read the interpreting signature text in that way. Rather, within the field sketch, uh, within the field sketch, there is first also the counter movement, that is, the possibility of deconstructing the Nietzschean simple reversal with Heidegger. Although this trait is uh, pretty much underdeveloped in Derrida, he actually just says you could also do that, and when Nietzsche says we just turn Platonism around, of course that can easily be deconstructed by Heidegger. So the first thing is that we always have the counter movement that we can deconstruct Nietzsche as well, or the simple reversal, or the motif of simple reversal in Nietzsche. And second, Derrida always maintains that Heidegger's text itself can be read in such a way that it calls into question its own metaphysical holds, a remark that we should keep in mind with respect to the Geschlecht text. And on the other hand, one must also keep in mind that in Derrida, the name Nietzsche by no means stands for die Sache seines Denkens, the subject matter of his thinking, or even for the form or economy of movement in Nietzsche's text. Rather, as Derrida says in the Difference essay, the name of Nietzsche, such as the name of Heidegger, serves merely as an index to designate a certain type of text or a certain type of textual, textual, textual structure. And yet, I think the name Nietzsche is at least a significant index to do so. Of course, it would be naive to present the outline Nietzsche-Heidegger constellation as the core of Derrida's readings of Heidegger, or even as the essence of deconstruction itself, or whatever one wants to call Derrida's discourse as such. Nonetheless, I take it uh, to form one strong and important layer of Derrida's philosophical endeavor, and second, to be irreducibly tied to his reading of Heidegger as at least one focal point. From here, I will turn to the Geschlecht texts, so second part. I hope the outline structure of the Nietzsche-Heidegger constellation has helped shedding some light on my initial questions. To ask the question regarding the presence or absence uh, of Nietzsche in the Geschlecht text is, I think, not an arbitrary question in so far as the movement or type of text associated with Nietzsche regularly or even constantly shows up in Derrida's readings of Heidegger at least until 1980. And at the same time, I hope it has become clear why I think it might be productive to link this question A, to the procedure or strategy of Derrida's readings of Heidegger and Geschlecht text, and B, to what one would, could call the continuity question. Because regarding the line of thought I just sketched, the presence or absence of Nietzsche might serve as at least one index to clarify as to how the reading of Heidegger in the Geschlecht texts work, and how this relates to and possibly differs from earlier readings and approaches. And to make it short, uh, these questions, and especially the one regarding Nietzsche's presence or absence, is of course uh, provoked by the fact that at least Nietzsche's name occurs only very rarely in the Geschlecht text, and if so, rather in passing uh, or in the margins. So I'll go through that quickly. So first in Geschlecht 1, Nietzsche is mentioned only once and very briefly in the opening pages. Here, Derrida opposes Heidegger's silence regarding the question of sexual difference to a tradition between Plato and Nietzsche, so that's where Nietzsche is, the tradition between Plato and Nietzsche, a tradition, tradition which has constantly addressed the topic of sexual difference. Stressing that this question has even found a place in Kant, Hegel, and Husserl, but there is no specific comment on Nietzsche here. And that is remarkable, at least, if we have in mind what major significance Derrida ascribed to the question of sexual difference in his affirmative reading of Nietzsche in the Spurs essay and how he had used precisely this question to undermine with Nietzsche the ontological fundamentality of Heidegger's questioning. Then in Geschlecht II, uh, Nietzsche is mentioned twice, first only in passing in mentioning Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche and Hölderlin, so that's actually not really mentioning Nietzsche. In the second instance, Nietzsche does enter the scene at an important point of the text, but again only in a side note. In speaking about Heidegger's hands and photographs depicting these hands holding a fountain pen over the manuscript, 
Derrida briefly points to Heidegger's critique of the typewriter, the Schreibmaschine, and thereby he simply mentions Nietzsche um, as that thinker of the West to own uh, the, that the first thinker of the West to own a type typewriter, the photograph of which we know. So we all know that uh, uh, picture of, of Nietzsche's typewriter. Um, but no further commentary here, although that would invite to make some further commentaries. Now in Geschlecht 4, uh, to skip Geschlecht 3 and then focus on that fully, uh, Heidegger's ear, Nietzsche is not mentioned at all. And again, this is remarkable given the fact that Derrida in the autobiographies text, uh, talk from 1979, published in 1985, focuses on Nietzsche's ear, and uh, so on Nietzsche's ear, and already in Spurs he had referred to the labyrinth of an ear in Nietzsche. So it would be likely that he cross-references uh, at least once. Now finally, um, the most occurrences of Nietzsche's name and the most interesting ones are to be found in the Geschlecht three texts. Yet here Nietzsche's sh uh, name shows in a rather peculiar way, which, as we will see, is partly due to the type of the text as being a seminar manus manuscript. Nietzsche's name does occur 12 times, so thanks for the PDF, that makes it easy to check. Uh, it occurs 12 times but it exclusively occur, occurs in quotations from Heidegger's texts, so through Heidegger's eyes, in a way, and in very brief commentaries by Derrida following these quotations. To begin with, uh, in a passage from the ninth session, Derrida quotes Heidegger saying that, with respect to Trakel, that Elis isn't a figure in which Trakel means himself. Rather, Elis is, well, this is Derrida quoting Heidegger, Elis is as essentially distinct from the poet as Zarathustra is from the thinker Nietzsche. Derrida adds in brackets that this comparison is not made by chance, and he also notes that he in the seminar should further explain Zarathustra's descent from the mountain, which Heidegger is here alluding to as well in the Untergang und Übergang. And in the main text, he uses the passage to clarify the way he takes Heidegger to be speaking about himself in a non-biographical way, just as he takes Nietzsche to be speaking about himself in Zarathustra and Trache uh, with respect to Alice. But there's no specific commentary on Nietzsche here either. That could go as, a, as just a passive remark. Several passages then refer to a phrase from Nietzsche which Derrida quotes through Heidegger quoting it, both in the Trache essay and in Was heißt Denken? This is the famous line, Der Mensch ist das noch nicht festgestellte Tier human being is that not yet determined or fixed animal, which is to be found in Beyond Good and Evil, uh, aphorism 62, and twice in Nietzsche's Nachlass as well. And the first passage uh, where this is mentioned from the Loyola script, Derrida quotes Heidegger's quotation from the Trakel essay, but postpones his commentary, so he says we will get back to that later on, until he will turn to the respective passage from Was heißt Denken. Thus, Derrida doesn't comment with respect to Nietzsche on the way Heidegger interprets this passage of Nietzsche's here. Heidegger says, this utterance, der Mensch ist das nicht festgestellte Tier, a human being is a not determined or fixed animal, this, uh, this utterance does not mean that human being hasn't been stated, constatiert as a fact, nicht constatiert als eine Tatsache. The saying means the animality of this animal, the rational animal, human being, um, hasn't been brought to firmness, ist noch nicht ins Feste gebracht worden. And um, Heidegger says again, it hasn't been brought home, that is to say, it hasn't been brought into, and here I quote the German first because I don't know how to translate that correctly, um, it hasn't been brought home, that is to say, into das Einheimische seines verhüllten Wesens. So into the home of its veiled essence, in a way. And Heidegger goes on to say that Western metaphysics struggles with this Feststellung, determination or fixation of human beings, since Plato. Derrida does briefly comment on the lexis of repatriation and home Heidegger deploys here. And in fact, this vocabulary comes very close to what Derrida had called Heidegger's hope in the Difference essay, but we find no comment explicitly addressing Nietzsche in Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche in this context. And this is quite a violent interpretation on Heidegger's part to say that Nietzsche means that der Mensch ist das nicht festgestellte Tier because he has not yet returned to his, in a way, original essence. Apparently, apparently Derrida has then indeed commented on that passage in which Heidegger quotes Nietzsche's saying about human being as the not yet fixed animal from Was heißt Denken. This is a very long quotation at the end of session 11, 
in the book version, page 137 following, referring to Nietzsche's Übermensch as well, but mostly drawing on the concept of Vernunft, reason, and not as explicitly as the former passage, involving the vocabulary of home and essence, which should be provocative to give down. In what he has highlighted here precisely, we do not know, because he just notes, read was heißt denken in French and comment. So we don't have the comments, we just have the <laughs> note that he will be making comments. Of course, it's idle speculation what he actually then underlined and commented about, but given the context, given the focus on Vernunft here in this passage, and given that it is the end of the session, I wouldn't assume that Derrida should have specifically addressed the Nietzsche question here as such. Now, finally, the most remarkable and, in a way, most characteristic passage regarding Nietzsche in Geschlecht 3 is to be found in the opening section to session 11. So that's page 121, if you want to have a look. The topic here is, again, Heimat, so homeland, as they translate in the official English translation. And, again, uh, this is a longer quotation, this time from the letter on humanism. By the way, the French version here is really... Uh, messy in a way. Uh, um, I think Derrida modified that a bit, but there's some things that are quite far from the German original. So as I read the, the quotation of Heidegger here, um, don't, you rather not try to read along because that will get things really confused because it's not the way that it's here in the French text. Now in the middle of this quotation, Heidegger ad addresses the Heimatlosigkeit, the homelessness of modern human beings, and adds, at last Nietzsche has experienced this homelessness. So in the text there is uh, le premier, but it should be le dernier. I don't know, uh, it, uh, Derrida seems to have uh, uh, quoted that um, uh, quite quickly. So at last, zuletzt, Nietzsche has experienced this homelessness of modern human beings. He was unable to find within metaphysics any other way out than the reversal of metaphysics. But that is the height of futility. That's Heidegger on Nietzsche with a pretty brutal remark. So this is an instance of the Nietzsche-Heidegger case Derrida had so sharply commented on, disembedding Nietzsche from Heidegger's interpretation, for instance, in the interpreting the signatures from 1980. And usually one would think, having these older texts in, in, in mind, that this would trigger some sort of a reaction by Derrida. Um, Derrida uh, here only uh, quotes the German, das aber ist die Vollendung der Auswegslosigkeit, so that's the height of futility, and he simply adds, comment, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so there is a certain attention to this passage, but Derrida um, doesn't do anything about it in the written out text. So in the written out text and the written out commentary, there's no, uh, no, not one word about Nietzsche and about the way Heidegger portrays him here. Uh, quite bluntly, as I said, as remaining fully caught up within metaphysics. That is, we have no proof that Derrida did in fact say anything about a constellation so crucial to his readings uh, of Heidegger in previous texts. So, and that's it about Nietzsche explicitly being present for, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Geschlecht text. So, in sum, the explicit commentary of Derrida on Nietzsche is throughout the Geschlecht series remarkably sparse, even if Derrida here, in the two most important instances, notes that he should further comment on Heidegger's utterances about Nietzsche. This doesn't seem to be important enough to, in fact, work out such commentary in the main texts. So we see some attention still to these passages, but apparently it's not the main line of thought, so he just says, comment on that briefly, but that's not where I'm really turning to. So we can in fact pose the question, what has happened here? Has Derrida forgotten Nietzsche in these texts? Because he only brings him in when Heidegger brings him in. Or does he even avoid discussing Nietzsche? To end the paper, let me quickly sketch four explanatory models of how one might understand that Derrida in the Geschlecht series of course with the older texts in mind, for the most part leaves aside Nietzsche. The first model would be a radical discontinuity model. According to this model, Derrida would have radically changed his strategy of reading Heidegger compared to earlier texts, such that Nietzsche, or the gesture associated with his name, simply wouldn't play a major role or no role at all anymore. Yet I think this appears to be hardly plausible as the reading of Heidegger also in the Geschlecht text relates quite strongly to motifs put forward, forward in earlier works drawing on Nietzsche. This is the case, for instance, and most obviously in Geschlecht 1, where Derrida dislocates the fundamentality of ontological difference by means of sexual difference. And remember the passage from Spurs I referred to earlier on, where Derrida does quite the same thing with Nietzsche. And in Geschlecht 2, 
We also find a passage briefly referring to a certain logocentrism in Heidegger, thereby pointing to the question of the truth of being, as in earlier texts where he does that with Nietzsche. And uh, related dislocating operations are to be found, although less obvious, also in Geschlecht 3, for instance, when Derrida points to a tension between the proper and strangeness, as uh, we uh, heard about in uh, several talks, where he uh, comments on uh, the polysemy and uh, Heidegger's uh, questioning directed at an original meaning of words, and also the relation between uh, dissemination and gathering we had in the talk before. So, um, I don't think the first model to say he has completely changed his mind about how he's going to read and deconstruct Heidegger works. Rather, we can see some motifs that are not just the same as, Heide as Derrida did in his earlier text, but strongly relate to them and can be seen in a certain continuity. Now, the second model, why Nietzsche is not there, would be the very simple explanation, and that would shatter my entire discourse, to say that um, Derrida doesn't address Nietzsche simply for reasons of restriction or limitation. That is to say, to not further complicate things, to not blur his main line of thought, or in the case of the seminar from which Geschlecht III is taken, simply for pedagogical reasons. And uh, in fact, I have to say, I think this is true, at least to a certain extent, um, because, uh, in, for instance, in Geschlecht II, Derrida speaks of the restricted economy I have imposed on myself for, his, for, uh, for this lecture. So there is a certain economy of limitation of what Derrida can do within these texts and cannot. For the most part, indeed, Derrida does limit himself in these texts to a close reading of Heidegger's works and to those authors Heidegger himself is mainly dealing with, Trakel, for instance, and not the ones that Heidegger mentions on the side. Yet this doesn't, although it might be true to a certain extent, as I said, this doesn't, I think, give a full and satisfactory explanation either, as Derrida, if we look at all of the Geschlecht texts, does from time to time involve quite considerable and lengthy, remark lengthy remarks on other thinkers. Uh, plus, he gives quite some cross-references to other texts of his own, but no one referring to the texts I have cited above on Nietzsche. So even if there is a certain restricted uh, economy that uh, uh, pr um, prevents Derrida from getting too much into the Nietzsche question, still it's, it's remarkable that there is uh, no <coughs> reference to Nietzsche at all uh, in footnotes and so forth. Now, the third model would be to explain the uh, leaving aside of Nietzsche by means of a shift of content. So that way of explaining the sparse remarks would be to say, uh, on Nietzsche would be to say that the specific contents Derrida is dealing with in Heidegger in the Geschlecht text doesn't invite referring to Nietzsche. Yet I, think the, uh, yet I think this sort of explanation, too, remains unsatisfactory for several reasons, and the logical ones, too. But first of all, because virtually all of the topic Derrida speaks about, for instance, Geschlecht itself, humanity, nation and nationalism, the idiom, animal, the ear, and so forth, have either been addressed in texts on Nietzsche as well, or could rather obviously be, re be related to Nietzsche, for instance, the nationalism question. This is also shown by the fact that Heidegger himself, as seen, relates Nietzsche and Trakel on certain issues in Geschlecht 3. So there's no strong reason why the content of Derrida's readings in, Geschlecht, uh, in the Geschlecht text should exclude Nietzsche. So fourth, the most promising option to explain the response remarks on Nietzsche seems to be to observe a certain shift of strategy and focus. So a certain shift as opposed to a radical discontinuity compared to earlier readings. To sketch very briefly what I think this shift consists in, just some aspect. First, Derrida, so to speak, zooms in, relying, uh, when dealing with Heidegger in the Geschlecht series, almost exclusively on an imminent and detailed reading of Heidegger's texts. So that's the strategy to really uh, move, uh, move into the text. In a certain contrast, contrast to the more programmatic utterances, utterances which I have quoted from earlier texts. Uh, and an at least related procedure can in fact be observed in some earlier texts as well, most notably perhaps in Usia and Gramé, which also goes uh, much more into detail, and which Heidegger also refers to in Geschlecht too. So first it's sort of a zooming in and staying within the Heideggerian text. And second, and in connection with this, in the Geschlecht texts, Derrida appears to follow an idea that was present right from the start, namely that Heidegger's texts may be opened up from within themselves, and that they dislocate their metaphysical holds by means of their own heterogeneity. A piece of evidence for a focus on such an internal procedure can be found in a passage from Geschlecht II, uh, which Rodrigo quoted partly yesterday, 
where Derrida writes, I never criticize Heidegger, in the quotation marks, so I never criticize Heidegger, and he goes on to say, without recalling that this can be done from other places in his own text as well. This text couldn't be homogeneous and is written at least by two hands. Of course, this shift in strategy and focus would have to be elaborated further, conceptually by clarifying in which way we could distinguish between a general rule or a general economy of reading on the one hand and a specific focus of such a general economy on the other hand without reproducing the idea of a fixed methodology that is then applied to specific cases. But uh, So the problem is that I'm trying to say the general economy of reading Heidegger hasn't changed essentially, but Derrida in a way zooms in and uh, uh, focuses on specific acts, aspects of the Heideggerian case, but this may not be understood by means of the methodo methodology that is then schematically applied. And textually, to sort out the procedure of the Geschlecht series in more detail, one would have to read closely through those quasi-methodological passages to be found mostly in the end of Geschlecht 2 and throughout Geschlecht 3, as have been discussed in several talks of this uh, conference already, and confront them with earlier utterances. Uh, I will just refer to one passage that hasn't been quoted, if I'm correct, <laughs> which is in the 13th session. An uh, interesting one. Derrida imagines his listeners to be uh, impatient because he's been dealing with Heidegger for so long, and he says, Encore Heidegger? So he brings up the question that the impatient uh, participants would be bringing up. And then he speaks, wh uh, says, why this return of Heidegger and this return to Heidegger? And he uh, says quite some interesting things why there's a repeated rereading, which, which also <coughs> sheds some light on how he's doing it in these texts. So, but I'm over time, I won't go, get, go into that in detail. Instead of a conclusion, let me just turn back very briefly to my initial question. So is Nietzsche present, present in the Geschlecht text? And ultim ultimately, to make it short, I would say, yes, he is. And namely, he is because Derrida does, in a certain sense, carry forward that decentering reading of Heidegger, which he had developed with, or at least tied to Nietzsche in the earlier texts. But thus, the presence of Nietzsche in these texts is such that one would have to call it latent or below the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, that was uh, very comprehensive. Um, and I was reflecting that uh, what we're doing, in part, is um, taking a, a certain stock of, of the situation now for readers of Derrida with the ongoing publication of the seminars um, that is going to accelerate and um, there are going to be far more things uh, forthcoming that we don't even know what they are yet. Um, uh, so our uh, sense of his, of the development of his thought and emphases within the thought and interpretations is on this kind of shifting ground. We all are aware of that. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm going to make a contribution to that um, because uh, you're quite right that that text, Interpreting Signatures, um, does not exist, is not published in French. Right. Uh, however, it does exist. It does. It does exist. Yeah. I can tell you where to find it. Great. In fact, I can tell you that you will soon be able to read it in a published version, because it is in La Ville à Mort, uh, which is forthcoming in April. It's session nine. Um, and uh, La Ville à Mort was 1975-76. The text you refer to is 1980, indeed. So Derrida went back to that seminar, took out that, that chapter, that session, which is on Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche. Um, and indeed, in your, your compendium there of all of these places where, de, where this triad occurs of Derrida, Nietzsche, Heidegger, uh, La Ville à Mort is, a, is going to be a very important place because he reads Heidegger's Nietzsche. Um, there's a lot on Nietzsche, but then there are 
two and a half, two and a half full sessions on Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche. Um, and you already gave the, an idea of what is at stake there, as you saw in the German and the French, or the German and the English versions of this text, which is the way in which Heidegger um, unifies Nietzsche's name. Um, and, um, and, and indeed his whole project and thought. And so not surprisingly, it's once again about gathering. And it's gathering up the Nietzschean Nachlass and, um, and giving us this, you know, um, metaf the last metaphysician and, and so forth version of Nietzsche. Um, but I, I just maybe a, a bit of a quip about the presence of Nietzsche in Geschlecht. When you underscored uh, at the beginning of your talk um, the word perhaps yes. in that phrase, this is perhaps what I am most interested in. I mean, as you know, uh, although the, it's later in Politics of Friendship that um, the dangerous perhaps of of Nietzsche is going to become a, is kind of taken over by Derrida as a, as a quasi Derridian Nietzschean signature, um, but already, of course, perhaps is a very occurs quite frequently. But I think we can already hear a Nietzschean echo yes. in in perhaps. Yes, yes, thank you. So uh, first, um, it's it's really interesting. Um, that Derrida says, uh, so thank you very much, uh, that Derrida says quite the same thing you just said about uh, Heidegger in the passage that I was uh, referring to at the end, because he says, we have all these lectures uh, being mm -hmm. published, and that's why we have to constantly reread how things work, not by means of a uh, archival genealogy, as Francesco pointed to, where we can say, oh, that's the original text and that's the derivative text, but still it, it, it enriches the picture. And it's great to know the interpreting signatures is there, because uh, I, I don't know, I think I, I read an article by Grandin, I, I don't remember who said he tried to trace back where the manuscript is, and the translators of the English version said, uh, they asked Derrida and it was lost. So, but apparently it is then uh, in a version in the seminar. That's great to have that. Well, the, no yeah. doubt um, it, there are revisions right. to what um, he, he um, presented in that exchange with Gautama. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, even in, in the, on the original typescript, which is what we worked from, right. I was one of the editors of La Vie La Mort, from on that original typescript there, and I don't happen to recall, although I could look it up. I'll show you during the break. Uh, I have the, the scan of the original. Um, w uh, he often made uh, his changes directly on the seminar session for a text that he was going to present in some other context, such as that exchange with Gadamer. That, that, that's fascinating. And on the, the dangerous perhaps is, um, I think it's in fact interesting to see how some thinkers come more to the foreground and then move a bit to the background, but then come to the fore again. And what I just find especially interesting is that still until 1980, he focuses so strongly on this Heidegger-Nietzsche relation, and then here it sort of drops <coughs> out. And I was just trying to figure out, does that mean that he changed yeah. completely? Yeah. Of course, changed completely, whatever, what, the, what, 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 that, what would that mean? That's not the case. So I think the Nietzschean lines that he worked out apparently, most of all in the 70s, or Nietzsche uh, being disembedded from Heidegger's firm grasp or as the last metaphysician, these are still in the background of some, or could be shown to be in the background of some things that he's doing in the Geschlecht text, although he, in a way, puts Nietzsche a bit of a, a, aside. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Philip, so much. That was so gripping. I, I agree with you, and I would uh, try to point something out to make your point even even stronger in, in, in some sense that, that, that Nietzsche is an underlying uh, force or presence qua absence. Um, precisely because I'm thinking of the seminar, La Vie la Mort, um, where um, what precedes the discussion of Nietzsche, so in session two of that seminar, we get a text that later became the year of the other. And there he opens up, he tells his students that he's going to indulge 
in what he calls autobiographical pleasure, uh, in, a, in the sense of, of uh, speaking of oneself. Um, and there are many doublings when he's speaking of Nietzsche, he speaks of himself. Um, and I was looking at Geschlecht 3 with this question of speaking of oneself. What does it mean to speak of oneself? And after, there's a passage, I think you touched on it, on it, on it briefly, but I wonder if that then doesn't make Nietzsche's presence uh, more salient. When, for example, so he has told us, right, that he thinks that what interests him the most, perhaps, was um, the fact that Heidegger is speaking of himself. But then he pays attention to how Heidegger might <laughs> respond. But I am writing here that, Zara, that Nietzsche is not speaking of himself when he right. says Zarathustra, or that Haku is not speaking of himself when he said at least. So Heidegger would say, I'm not speaking of myself either. And then he says here, Tahida, uh, this allows me to. Cela me permet de préciser que quand je disais que Heidegger parlait en somme, qu'il est voulu non de lui et de sa signature, je ne l'entendais pas au sens conventionnellement autobiographique que Heidegger accuse ici. Like, I didn't mean this in the autobiographical sense that Heidegger would refuse here, in the sense of between Ellis and Tracco. Then the Heidegger says, but I would insist that in another register, in another, according to another regime, Heidegger speaks of himself as long as we understand this differently than psychology, subjectivity, and the self, he speaks of his own place and what happens to him in his demarche and his signature. And then he says, just as I would say that Nietzsche speaks of himself in Zarathustra and that Haku speaks of himself in the name Ellis. Right. So that that's just to maybe highlight this notion that speaking of himself, the whole what interested him the most in Geschlecht 3 might actually be coming from this autobiographical pleasure. Right. Uh, that Nietzsche, perhaps none, but that no one better than Nietzsche taught Derrida when right. signing his name and speaking his name in, in right. the text. Right. Uh, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, in fact, that relates both to these autobiography texts uh, focusing on Nietzsche and his autobiography of Ecce Homo, where Nietzsche says, right. I will tell myself my story. Well, I see mir meine Geschichte. Yes. Um, and, uh, but it also already relates to the Interpreting Signatures text, where Derrida follows Heidegger in um, trying to, uh, um, to avoid the psychological or traditionally biographical interest in Nietzsche. But he does something that he does too in the Geschlecht text. He sort of sorts out what Heidegger <coughs> doesn't want it to be and follows that, the mm -hmm. traditional discourse, as you also put in your paper. But then he says, it's not the only alternative to then search for the truth of being. Mm -hmm. But rather, precisely, Nietzsche teaches us that there could be another politics of the name quite the way that you mm -hmm. sketched it. So, yeah. yes, I think we can, I, I could make that a bit stronger, but I first had to sort out of things. Course, course. But um, that's very helpful to, to refer to that text as well. Thank you. Can I add something additional? Uh, philology, not a question. Because he taught a uh, autobiography, uh, politic de, de non prop yes. sur Nietzsche, he comes also, also from the, 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 the seminar. Yes. 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 They follow so, each yeah. other. Right, right, right. Okay, I have to check that. Yes. I'd like to ask about the uh, English slash the curse. Yes. That issue of the curse. That, that, that gets taken up in Nietzsche too, with the issue of the schlock, right? The, the blow with woman, that uh, one approaches woman with a whip, the, that's a fame, infamous statement. Yes. And that issue of the curse goes back in Western history, of course, into, into Genesis. It, it gets taken up by commentators on Genesis. It turns up in Paradise Lost in Book 10, yes, yes. rather prominently. Um, sure, yes. Can you comment about that? I'd be kind of interested to... I, 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 I would have to think about it a bit more. Um, there are some motifs also with the tip of the spear that we that, that we discussed several times. This, these more phallic images that also come up in the Spurs text. So I think there is a connection between certain elements um, already on on the level of well, to say quickly, metaphors uh, that are used and that also relate to Nietzsche. So that might be the case as well with respect to that one. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you might. Uh, be willing to elaborate a little bit more on the phrase that you had difficulty translating, yes. and specifically how Einheimisch would be different than, say, Heim or Heimat in this case. So as you were talking about, the Mensch is noch nicht festgestellt ist hier, there was a question of, I wrote it down correctly, this Einheimischen uh, seines verhüllten Wesens. Yeah. Um, Einheimisch, 
local in the sense of, t of an animal, Tia, indigenous, um, native, but not, we're not searching for a home here. We're searching for a sense of home or a homeliness or a belonging to a place. And I wonder how that might relate to or possibly complicate the notions of sort of gathering and dispersion that right. we're talking about. Um, well, I would say that, that this is, in a way, just, okay, a good question. I would have to check the, the, the context in Heidegger again and see how he, if he makes, really makes a difference between Heimisch and Einheimisch. I'm not sure at the moment. I would have to check back. I don't actually think so. I think that Einheimisch just, in a way, underlines this, this uh, or it brings together, just as you put it, the, the home aspect with the being native, in a way. Mm -hmm. So bringing you back to your original home, that would be what, what Heidegger is saying here. Uh, or bringing it back to the... Uh, and, it, and it has the, the, the connotation of being one's own. If you would say, ins heimische Wesen, that wouldn't really make sense. Das einheimische Wesen sounds like his very own homely essence, in a way. So it brings together the aspect of, of, of native, of oneness, uh, of, uh, and of originality, and the Ein, I think, just, just underlines that. As a searching for a home within one's own being. Right, yes. And, and, and one original lost, uh, which has been lost in the Seinsvergessenheit of metaphysics, in a way. Um, it, it's almost a comment, but I, I think I can turn it into a question. It's Nietzsche's presence, especially at the outset of Heidegger's Sprache and Gedicht. It seems to me that the whole interpretation of the line, es ist die Seele ein Fremdes auf Erde. When Heidegger says explicitly what that cannot be, and then gives his affirmative interpretation that it is the human being coming down to the earth, there's nothing more Nietzschean in Heidegger's entire repertoire than that. Right. So that makes either Nietzsche's absence from Geschlecht III bizarre, or it might in some odd way explain it. In other words, Nietzsche in the early 1950s, in Was heißt Denken, and in this text, becomes such a forceful character. He becomes the, the Kronzeuge. He becomes the star witness for Heidegger. So it seems to me the whole of Die Sprache und Gedicht is Nietzschean through and through. So I say that just to say it makes the, it makes the paradox that you're working on even more astonishing. Or it might be that for Derrida, this presence of Nietzsche in Die Sprache und Gedicht is so eclatant, it's so obvious that it causes him to pull back. <coughs> so I just wonder if, if that makes sense to you, and which way you would take that. Is it Derrida's pulling back because Nietzsche's presence is so obvious in Heidegger's mm -hmm. reading of Trapper? Yes. Or is it, does it simply aggravate the, the paradoxical nature of, of, of what you're doing? I, I would actually more say the latter, that it aggravates the, the, the paradox in a way, because um, I think you're perfectly right, and uh, I think that is also why he brings in this passage from the letter uh, on humanism, where, he's, where uh, Heidegger says, diese Heimatlosigkeit hat zuletzt Nietzsche uh, erfahren. Oder zuletzt hat Nietzsche diese Heimatlosigkeit erfahren. So this aspect of homelessness, Derrida brings in a passage on Nietzsche, which relates to uh, the passage uh, at the outset of Heidegger's text. But still, it's really um, remarkable then that uh, Derrida doesn't point to the way that Heidegger, uh, or, or uh, he doesn't point to the ambiguous gesture that Heidegger makes towards Nietzsche. At the one hand, taking so much and being so much Nietzschean, but on the other hand saying, he did experience this homelessness, but he failed completely. Die reine Auswegslosigkeit. In the French version there, it's even stronger. He closed all paths and ways. That, that's the way that, that, it's, that it's translated here. And, so, uh, and, and that would be an ambiguity that Heidegger, in a way, uses Nietzsche and takes so much from him, but then puts him aside and says, but you're still within metaphysics. That should trigger something in Derrida. And I just think that he's, 
working on a, with a certain economy that forbids him to go into that deeply. And he doesn't quote these passages because Nietzsche is in there, but it happens to him in a way that Nietzsche is in there, and then he says, comment on that, comment on that, comment on that, but he uses the passages to show something, something else. So Nietzsche comes in, and Derrida sees him coming in, and sees him coming in as an important figure, but I think just mainly for the, the, the specific strategy he's using with respect to Heidegger, he puts that aside. But still, it, it haunts the text in a way.